Good morning. This is the Keeping It Real Sunday School class from Cornerstone Baptist Church in Richland, Missouri. I'm Dr. Max Thornsbury and I'm the teacher. My wife Brenda is going to assist me today in reading the scriptures and trying to keep me out of trouble and probably trying to keep me from singing a hymn or two. And so I'm going to ask Brenda to start this morning by reading Psalms 95, verse 1 through 3. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Come, let us sing. I think there's a song like that, isn't there? Well, there is, but the second part is actually of that verse is more like you. Make a joyful uh, noise? Yes. Well, I can do that. I'm sure you can. I can make a joyful noise. Well, our lesson today is about embracing joy, and we're going to eventually end up in the Christmas story today. And um, this is the time of joy, isn't it? The Christmas season, joy to the world. And we're going to see why it was joy to the world, but why Christ brought peace between God and man, but not peace between men. And unfortunately, at Christmas season, we tend to have a... Um, I don't know, a lofty view that the Christmas season is all about peace and goodwill. Well, it is peace and goodwill, but it's peace and goodwill between God and men because Christ came as God incarnate, died on the cross. And as a result of that, the wrath that God has against us because of our sin is removed by the covering of Jesus. And so we have peace with God. We're going to see what the Bible has to say about the concept of joy and peace. This is a psalm that most of us memorized part of uh, during Bible school. And uh, it corresponds quite well with Psalms 100, Brenda. Would you read Psalms 100 for us, please? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be fa thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. What is it about praising the Lord, Brenda, that brings joy to the heart? You know? Yes. Uh, it says in another place that God inhabits the praises of his people. So whenever you're praising him, whenever you're singing to him, the Holy Spirit, uh, you can feel physically and emotionally and spiritually feel. And so that's why it brings joy, because you can feel the Holy Spirit. And there can be a lot of trials and tribulations and troubles in life, but by pushing those aside and focusing entirely on our relationship with the Lord and lifting up Him in praise and worship, they kind of disappear at least. That's one of the reasons why I enjoy going to church so much, because for a couple hours at least on Sunday morning, uh, the world is pushed aside, mm -hmm. and our focus is on God. Our focus is on Jesus. And I want you to know when it says make a joyful noise that the Jewish people were exceptionally good at this. And when they had praise and worship, it was very animated. It mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, uh, chanting and um, soft little songs and hymns. Uh, they used lots of instruments, harps, trembles. Is that right? Trim. No, not trembles. Symbols? <laughs> I don't know what well, you're it's something that starts with a T. I don't know. Some sort of musical instrument. And uh, But they did use cymbals. They used all kinds of musical instruments. Horns, um, stringed instruments. They, if you've ever watched a Jewish celebration at a bar mitzvah or some other event, uh, they'd be classified in our circles as Pentecostal or charismatic. <laughs> Not, not as subdued as we Baptist star in some cases. And I love it. I love it. I love to watch it. Um, I love to see it. I love to experience it. And that's what the psalmist is talking about here. He's talking about getting with it in praise and worship. Now there's a time for quiet contemplation, is there not? Of course. There's a time for meditation. There's a time for reverent hymns. I love the hymns. We sang at Swedberg here just a couple of weeks ago when I preached Marching to Zion. Beautiful old hymn. 
said the first time that hymn was ever sung in England, that when they finished singing it, the whole crowd got up and cheered and clapped because their songs had been so mundane, so slow, so sedate, that when they got to sing that song, they were just overwhelmed with joy. That's what praising God brings us, is it not? It, it should bring us joy, an opportunity to put the world beside it, and uh, really not have a lot of restraint in our exuberance for what um, Christ has done for us. Brenda, I'd like you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and read for me verse 4, and then we're going to go back um, and read Romans 1.16, so you'll be pretty close there. 1 Corinthians 10, chapter 4. First I mean, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now they're talking about the water that came out of the rock when Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock, and the rock spewed out sweet water, not bitter water. It's um, a reference that our praise and worship should be like that. When this psalmist is talking about the rock of our salvation, that's kind of what he's referencing here. He's referencing back to the Egypt to the Israelites on their sojourn in the wilderness, escaping the Egyptians. And then Romans 1, 16, please. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So uh, we have something to sing about, don't we? Absolutely. We have something to shout about, to jump up and down about, to clap our hands about, to have some exuberance about in our worship. Uh, we have the answer, right, in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the enmity between God and man removed by the God-man, Jesus Christ. Amen. And if we know Him as our Lord and Savior, John the Baptist said, the wrath of God is not on us. And if we don't know Him, the wrath of God still abides on us. Jesus put it this way in talking to the Pharisees. He said, uh, you're, yet, you're going to die yet in your sins if you don't believe on Me. Mm -hmm. You're going to die yet in your sins. And that is something we certainly do not want to do. If We should have that beautiful message and be willing to preach it from the mountaintops. Make a joyful noise. I'm not afraid to make a joyful noise because I can't sing a lick. But I like to sing, and so I try to sing. But uh, the Lord knows, and He said to make a joyful noise, so by gosh, that's what I'm going to do. Not right this minute, though, right? We're marching no, 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 to no, no, Zion. No, no, no. Beautiful. No, okay. Luke 2, 4 through 7, please, Brenda. We're going to jump to the New Testament, and uh, we're going to read the Christmas story. And we only really have two books that tell us anything about the Christmas story. Matthew wrote um, a lot about what happened to Joseph, and Luke wrote about what happened uh, to Mary. Mary uh, spent the latter part of her life under the uh, protection of the Apostle John, who was her nephew, the youngest of the Apostles, 17, 18 time frame in life when Jesus was crucified. John lived the longest. He's the last possible Apostle to pass away, way up in the 90s, A.D. 90s. So 60-some years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, he's still going. You can go to Ephesus to the tomb of Mary where Mary was buried. And we have evidence in the book of Acts that um, Luke met with John Mark and followed John Mark. He also spent a lot of time with Paul. Luke was a physician. He was a Greek. Um, well versed in scholarship. Well versed in recording, record keeping, uh, patient records, all of the things that a physician would be involved with. And sitting at the feet of, G of Mary, he records what we have in the book of Luke about the Christmas time story. Now, God does not reveal everything in this portion of Scripture. We don't have the answer to every little question we might have. We have what God has decided to reveal to us. And so as we look through here, we might um, subjectively think about what could have happened, maybe what did happen. But what we know happened is recorded in these words. 
So if you would read Luke chapter 2, 4 through 7, please. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Las Posadas. Mm -hmm. Las Posadas. That's um, celebrated a lot in Latin America. We've been to San Antonio, and we have seen that, haven't we, Brenda? We have. Mary and Joseph and the donkey are rushing around trying to find a place to spend the night. A couple of interesting things here. They did not live in Bethlehem. They lived in Galilee. And Galilee is in the area around the Jezreel Valley, it's north of Mount Carmel. It's about 90 to 100 miles away from Bethlehem. So they get, she rode a donkey. He uh, walked. Can you imagine walking from here to Columbia? Uh, uh, no, thank you. On you riding a donkey? Uh, I don't think so. Pretty rigorous trip. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but they wouldn't go through Samaria. They, had, they went around it. Oh, my goodness. What a trip for a lady that's nine months pregnant. I don't want to get into all the details of this because that's not the purpose of our lesson here today. But what do you think that it means that um, they went there to be taxed with his espoused wife? I think the New King James says registered, but it means registered to be taxed. Well, it was. it's just like we today have to you know, give all of our information and, and we're taxed too. Yep. It means that taxes have been around a long time. Heavy thumb of the government, right? Uh -huh. Exactly. And uh, Caesar Augustus has sent out a decree, made it uh, necessary, that everyone go to the city of their particular heritage and lineage and a census be recorded. Somebody wrote it down, rolled it up, stuck it in a file cabinet somewhere, Ben-Hur, the movie Ben-Hur has probably got the best rendition of that. When you see Ben-Hur talking to the Roman officials in the background, you see these big filing systems with all these scrolls. They knew where everybody was. They knew their name, you know, how many kids were in their family, and then they taxed them um, to the point almost of suppression of the Israeli people. Awful suppression. Uh, they squeezed the cash out of them, so mm -hmm. to speak. And so, what does it mean that Mary was his espoused wife? Well, it means that she had been um, promised to him, and he had promised to take her as his wife. But in the Jewish uh, tradition, it would sometimes take as long as a year before the end. It would be, it was more like our, our engagement, only it was binding, more yeah. binding than our They were officially married, day. or they couldn't yes. have traveled together without a chaperone. Correct. Um, but that means they had not consummated their relationship. They were not allowed to do that until they had the wedding feast, until they had the midnight call, mm -hmm. so to speak. And, of course, we know from Matthew that the angel came, Gabriel came to uh, Matthew and told him not to be a Joseph, I mean. We see it in the book of Matthew. Uh, not to be afraid to take Mary for his wife, and he did, he did move in and do the right thing. And... Uh, we know that from the Bible, it makes it very plain this was her firstborn son. And what does that mean? It means there were probably a second, a third. Well, there were more, yes, right? We know more. there are from Scripture. Now, mm -hmm. the Catholic Church says that she remained of forever a virgin and that Ro jo Mo or Joseph was an old man when they got married and she never had any uh, relationships with him. And uh, John, Pope John Paul said she's a co-redemptress with Christ. None of that which we believe is biblical. That's tradition, not, not biblical. And we know that the uh, half-brother of Jesus, James, by half-brother I mean his father was Joseph and not God, and his half-brother Jude both have books in the New Testament and uh, were very, very major leaders in the church. I'll not go into all the history behind that. But... Uh, we know that Bethlehem means uh, the house of bread. Isn't it interesting that the bread of life is born in the city named the house of bread? <laughs> kind of interesting point. And we know that this was predicted in the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. We'll not go there and read that. Uh, that this is a fulfillment of Scripture, both uh, Luke and 
Matthew make that uh, point very clear. And it says when her days were accomplished, she would be delivered. We know that they went to this town, and because all of these other people were going there uh, to undergo this taxing and this census and you know record all their information, that there wasn't anything, no place left to live. Uh, there was no room in the hotel, the inn. There just wasn't. Any. So they end up in the in the up in a stable, and. This is probably not a stable like um, we would think of, a wooden structure leaned to out there, but this was a carved out structure in, a, in the side of a, of a, of a rock wall, kind of like a man-made cave type thing, but it's just a place where they keep livestock. I mean, that's, you know, I don't know, I spend half my life trying to teach people how to disinfect their facilities. This wasn't the most ideal location. And when it says the time is accomplished, what do you think that means? Well, that means that it was time for her to give birth. And it also means that it was God's divine time that, right. she, that, he, he, that she had this baby on that particular night mm -hmm. at that particular time. And she was, of course, ready to have this baby. I don't, you know, all we can contemplate all we want. Did she have some help? Were there some midwives there? Very likely this is a very young girl. You know, we think maybe 14, 15, 16. I'm not sure unless there's some supernatural intervention that she's going to be able to have this baby on her own. But in any case, uh, whether she had some midwives to help her, which is very common in the Jewish culture, and I'm sure there were some in Bethlehem, um, she brought forth this child and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and did not have a crib, did not have a special little room built. No pack and play? No, no pack and play. She laid him in a feed trough. And I'm sure they had some hay or straw or something that they laid in there to try to make it as nice as they could. But here you have the Son of God, God incarnate, God Himself, being born into this world as a baby, human being, with no place to lay His head. Nothing. As humble a beginning as you could possibly get. Mm -hmm. um, imagine what the wise men thought of this. We know it, they probably came a little later on because it says when he come to see the young child. But golly, wouldn't you expect a king to be born into absolute splendor? You would expect that, Silk yes. clothes and fancy quilts and the best of everything? Yes, you would. Not so our Savior. No. Not so. So, Brenda, would you read 8 through 14, please? And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, an angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were very much afraid. They were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now, there's some very important points to be made here. The angels, instead of announcing this miraculous event, this timing that Daniel had predicted, um, they did not go to the highest level of society. They went to a group of people that were husbandrymen, taking care of livestock. Mm -hmm. I think that's very significant. I think it is too. Very significant. And uh, not only that, the shepherds at this time were not looked upon as being what would be ritually clean in Jewish society because they're helping ewes have lambs. They've got manure on their hands. they got wool grease on their hands. They're, you know, all the things that would make you unclean ritually. And yet they go directly from keeping these flocks right straight to the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Clean or unclean? It don't matter, does it? It don't matter. And a couple of interesting points here is that these angels surrounded them. Um, they're in the air. 
and they're announcing this birth. And it says here that these men were sore afraid. Now, if you look in the Greek, this means that they were in complete and total awe. Maybe they had never seen an angel before. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they read about them. Um, the Old Testament's full of, uh, of opportunities to study about them. But all of a sudden, here they are in all their splendor. And the angel tells them not to be afraid. You can be in awe if you want to. You don't worship us. We're angels. You don't worship us. You worship God Almighty. You can be in awe if you want to, but don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Do not be afraid. And then explains to them about the birth of Jesus some signs of how they're going to find him. And the major sign being that he will be in a manger. Every baby brought forth in Jewish society was wrapped in swaddling clothes. It's a method that they used from their time in Egypt. But uh, not many were going to be lying in a manger because that would have been unclean. That would have started out life as ritually unclean. That was the symbol they were looking for. And so they get this sign. What do they do? They just go around and start looking for barns, don't they? Mm -hmm. It's pretty simple. They don't have to go to every house because if he's lying in a manger, there's a limited number of places where livestock are. And they found him. And it says, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying. Now, I always believed that angels would be singing. But when we look in Revelation and other parts of the Bible, we don't see anywhere where angels actually sing. We sing, see that the saints sing, the 24 and elders sing a new song. Um, we know that there are instruments in heaven because there's two mentions of having harps in heaven. Um, there's no evidence that angels sing. Well, that explains your inability to <laughs> cope. <laughs> You're going to run everybody off, Brid. But I think they did. Because no, it says did. here that they were praising, praising God. God. And how do you praise God? You praise Him in song, right? Well, it says, and saying. And saying. But that's not singing. No, I know. That's and unfortunately, that, that's a little bit of a letdown for us at Christmas time <laughs> because when I did all the Christmas plays at Sweetburg, we always had singing angels. Yeah, well. But I don't know. It doesn't matter whether they sing or not, but I can tell you human beings are going to sing in heaven. Absolutely. They're going to sing a new song. Whether God allows the angels to sing or not, I can't, uh, I can't identify entirely. So I want, to, uh, I want to address a couple of three things here, Brenda, in this particular lesson. Turn with me to Isaiah 57 and read verse 14 through 21. Isaiah 57, verse 14 through 21. And shall say, Cast up, cast up, prepare the way, take up the stumbling block out of the way of my people. For thus saith the high and lofty one who inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in a high and holy place with him also who is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not contend forever, neither will I always be angry. For the spirit should fail before me and the souls which I have made. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I angry and smote him. I hid myself and was, an ang was angry and he went on black back sliding in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the troubled sea, when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked." Well, that is one of the points that I wanted to bring out of that scripture. Peace only comes to those that seek God and seek to live according to His will. It says there is no peace for the wicked. No. There is no peace for the wicked. And we know that because um, Brenda and I attended church at, at San Antonio last Sunday. I say San Antonio because yeah, that's what most older people call it, San Antonio, but they call it San Antonio. San Antonio, Texas, and um, 
uh, a house church, basically. Mm -hmm. And our lesson and sermon that day and teaching was about peace. Mm -hmm. And so the pastor, Mike, asked what Mike Kraft asked the question, what is peace? Mm -hmm. And I didn't answer, but I went around the room and a lot of people, the thing that came to my mind is peace is war. Well, that seems counter to what we would think about peace, right? Mm -hmm. But in this life, this side of the millennial reign of Christ, there is no peace. There is peace with God, but there will be no peace on earth because there is no peace for the wicked. Mm -hmm. We are in a battle with the forces of evil. And that battle shall not cease until Christ rules with the rod of iron as he sits on the throne of David in Jerusalem during the millennial reign. He will have bound up all evil by that time and destroyed all the forces of men that have aligned themselves with Satan. Then we will have peace. Mm -hmm. Until that time, the Bible says there will be lots of talk about peace. And so, Brenda, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. This is the Apostle Paul giving us 22 commandments. Now, I don't like to use that word. Paul said we're saved by, by uh, grace, um, through faith, not of works. He's not saying you've got to do these things. But here's 22 things he thinks that a Christian should actually live by. But in the process of leading up to those 22 things, he gives us this statement. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now, the Apostle Paul says in Galatians that he was taught all of his understanding um, about prophecy, about Christ, it was all taught to him directly by Christ while he was in the wilderness. It wasn't taught him by any man, he says. And when he went to Jerusalem first time, the disciples were amazed. He actually spent more physical time with Christ than the disciples did. They had three and a half years, and most scholars believe he had from 11 to 13 years of time with Christ's instruction. So we have to hold in very high esteem what the Apostle Paul has written to us on the influence of the Holy Spirit. He says when people say, peace, peace, destruction's coming. Mm -hmm. So we have this misnomer understanding that Christ is bringing peace. He is going to bring peace. But let's see what Christ himself said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 39. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 39. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be, shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. I read the very first part of that. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Now, why do we get that so confused at Christmas time? Probably because we don't really want to think about the alternative. You know, everybody wants to say, and it's, it's true, God is love. Jesus is love. And that's true, but at the same time, um, all you have to do is look at what's happening now and um, the persecution that we are beginning to see of Christians, of people who believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, it isn't peaceful. No, nope. it's any in means. our own country. Yes, I know. Established on Judeo Christian principles in our own country. Yeah, I really didn't expect um, to see that in my life. I didn't either. I grew up in a time where Christianity was held in high esteem. Yeah. Um, the truth of the matter is the Christmas story is about God's peace with man. Yes. Not man's peace with man. No. There will never be peace man to man. Uh, we can try. 
We have treaties with various countries. We have allies in Canada and Great Britain and France. But we have enemies. Mm -hmm. And the enemies seek to destroy us. God has told us not to live in a state of fear that He will provide for us. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Um, but He doesn't promise us peace. No. There is not a promise of peace. What is the promise? The Tribulation sword. Tribulation. Yeah. The sword. <laughs> yeah. What did the Apostle Paul tell Timothy? Uh, he said in, in 2 Timothy, I believe it was, he made this statement, those who seek to live righteously shall suffer persecution. Mm -hmm. Prosecution and persecution. Mm -hmm. um, that's our promise. And yet we seem surprised by that when it comes. Instead of knowing that the Bible has told us that's what we are to expect, if you love me, the world will hate you, we almost have like a fairy tale view of what it's going to be like. It's going to get worse as we go along, not better. We don't like that for our grandkids and our kids and eventually their kids. Um, but that's the way it is. That's the way it's going to be. It's not going to be different. Um, what well, our responsibility is to stand up for what is right, preach the gospel, evangelize. And essentially, that's what this angel is doing, right? Mm -hmm. This angel is evangelizing. It's giving the good news about the coming of Jesus Christ. And that good news is that Christ has removed enmity between God and man. Mm -hmm. That is it. Peace on earth, good will toward men mm -hmm. is for God's relationship with men. And uh, if we're expecting peace on earth otherwise, then we're not being realistic. Turn to 1 Peter 1 verse 8, Brenda. 1 Peter 1 verse 8. Whom, having not seen, you love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, we are to have joy unspeakable. What is that joy to be generated from? From the fact that Christ died on the cross for us. Mm -hmm. From the fact that his blood covers us. From the fact that in Ephesians chapter 2, the apostle Paul's salvation comes through faith, by grace, not a works, lest any man should boast. That's what we're to take joy in. Mm -hmm. Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's joy. Mm -hmm. That's what we can take ultimate joy in. If the very fact that that gift is free, and we are free to take it, and the Bible says whosoever. Mm -hmm. Whosoever. No restrictions, no restraints, no age group, no ethnicity. No race. Um, they are neither male nor female, nor Jew nor Greek, nor bond nor free. All are one mm -hmm. in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's the joy that we should have at Christmas time as we see what uh, the Lord has done for us. Now, I've had several discussions this week that to the extent that they say we as Christians should just accept God's will in this election that uh, the Bible says that no one has any power except God allow it, which I agree with. But, um, but I don't believe this is God's will. I don't believe it's God's will that we put in an administration that has said that they're going to take away our firearms. I don't believe it's God's will we put in an administration that says they're going to approve and support abortion at any state, any point of gestation. I don't believe we want, God wants someone in that has said they would support euthanasia. I don't think we need someone in office, or God wants someone in office, um, who has said there is no male or female. Mm -hmm. You're not born male or female. That marriage is not between a man and a woman. Now, I could go on and on. The Democrat platform is absolutely full of things that are unbiblical and unsupportable with Scripture. When the God had Samuel anoint Saul as king. If you remember in the Old Testament, God told the people through Samuel that they didn't want a king. He told them exactly what the king was going to do, that he was going to take their men and put them in his army. They were going to have to pay tribute to him because he was going to tax them. They were going to take their daughters and make them handmaidens of the king. 
uh, he went on with quite a long list of things. He says, you do not need a king. I am your king. And they clamored and begged for a king. And you remember what God told Samuel when Samuel came to him so disappointed in the people. You remember what God said to him? He said, Samuel, they have not disrespected you. They've disrespected me. Mm -hmm. They have not rejected you. They've rejected me. And what did God do? He said, go anoint Saul. Greatest mistake they ever made in history. Absolute, total, complete disaster. Now, it led to the point that David was anointed king, and Christ shall sit on David's throne in Jerusalem, and he is fulfillment of the prophecy that David's kingship shall endure forever. His lineage as king of Israel shall endure forever. God gives you what you ask for, is what happens. It isn't necessarily that God wants you to have it. You clamor long enough and beg long enough, He can tell you that you should not have these things, that these are against my word, these are against my plan. You get it and all the consequences that come with it. So God um, does not promise us peace and prosperity on this earth. He does not promise us um, that we're going to have everything easy. He promises us that we're going to be persecuted, that we're going to have trials and tribulations, we're going to have difficulties, that uh, Christ says, I did not come to bring peace for men on this earth. I came to bring a sword and that Knowing Christ and taking Christ and loving Christ is divisive. If you don't think it's divisive, be a young Muslim man or woman, take Christ in the middle of a Muslim country or in the middle of a Hindu country and see what happens. You think you're going to see division? You're going to see difficulty, trials, tribulations, persecution, maybe even honor killing and death simply because you made the decision to take Christ. I came to put variance between a son and a father and a mother and a daughter. And it happens to this day. So, let's be a little careful not to fantasize a fairy tale when we think about the Christmas story. What we are to do is to celebrate the joy and peace that Christ brings to us through His shed blood. The fact that God picked the appointed time to bring Christ into this world in the absolute most humble... I mean born in a barn, laid in a feed trough. I don't know how any more humble you can get than that. And to establish through the spirit world a means by which man could have the wrath of God against sin removed from his life. Uh, Jesus said, if you don't believe in me, you're going to die yet in your sins. Yet in your sins. And that's where you don't want to be. You don't want to be yet in your sins. You want to have the blood covering of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the joy and peace that the Apostle Peter said is unspeakable. I think there's a song like that, Joy Unspeakable. Yeah, there he is. But... Okay. Well, thank you for being with us this morning. Um, wish you all a very Merry Christmas, and I hope you have a great time with your family. I would pray that this tyranny and um, persecution of Christians and churches and our gatherings. Our freedom to worship is removed. We had a couple of very good Supreme Court rulings this week. How in the world a state would go so far as to take all the way to the Supreme Court where they're not churches had to shut down, where the state had the right to shut down a church. I saw John MacArthur had issued something that said, no place in the Bible will you ever see that Christ said, I came to make a church safe for you. No place. No place. Now, we should take some mitigation measures. We should do what's uh, some common sense. Jesus said we're supposed to be wise as a uh, fox and subtle as a serpent. We know some things help. Uh, we can keep our distance. We can disinfect our hands. If we think we have the disease, I think we should wear a mask. But we're not to be restrained from our worship of the Lord. And I hope you have an unrestrained Christmas and a wonderful time with your family. Thank you very much.